Welcome to this edition of Business Battleground, where we're going to be taking a look at the new world order that we're looking at in the 2020s. So, as some of you know, Watch Mojo, the company I founded in 2006, launched with a vision to inform and entertain with a video on every topic. The opportunity then in 2006 was that audiences were moving online, storytelling was moving from text to video format, but yet the economics sucked. What does that mean? By 2006, you had things like Google and Craigslist that had already started to decimate print advertising. Newspapers and magazines were slowly but surely starting to go out of business, but there remained this big $75 billion ad opportunity around television. However, in 2006, it made no sense for video programming to move from TV to the internet the way slowly but surely print, be it newspapers or magazine content, had already started to move online. When we launched in 2006, you had already seen a number of platforms come and go where audiences watched videos. Before 2000s, you had players like Real Player. From 2000 to 2004, people were watching videos on portals Yahoo, AOL, and MSN, as well as on publishers like Ebombs World. By the mid-2000s, you had this emergence of these video platforms like YouTube, but also Rever, Gooba, Metacafe, and Daily Motion, and that's around the time that WatchMojo launched. At that moment, there was absolutely no economic incentive for traditional publishers of video programming to take their premium content and put it online. So WatchMojo recognized this vacuum and basically built the business around it. As we look at 2020, the question for me as an entrepreneur and an operator is, can we still use the same playbook or is it time for a new game? So if you were to go back in time, it's 2005, and I'm basically trying to build a business around online video. If you look at the content pyramid, at the top, you had what I would refer to as super premium programming, which included not just cable and network programming, but also that you would find in theatrical releases at the movies. That kind of content was expensive to produce, and the economics online were simply not compelling enough for the producers and owners of that content to embrace the web. If you jump to the bottom of that pyramid, you had already seen the revolution that had been ushered in through user-generated content, where changes in publishing and cheaper production equipment had made everybody become a content creator, and that was going to change news gathering, publishing, and the media landscape. But when it came to ad-supported programming, marketers were simply not comfortable running their premium ads next to UGC. In between super premium content and UGC, I recognize this opportunity around premium content. WatchMojo devised an editorial strategy that would capitalize by this opportunity and vacuum whereby traditional rights holders were still waiting on the sideline and marketers were not yet embracing UGC. Over the course of the ensuing three to five years, we started to produce a lot of content that was very horizontal in nature. Lifestyle programming, such as travel, fashion, health, beauty, cooking, and then by around 2009, we decided to really zone in more and more to produce biographies, profiles, and lists on the people, places, franchises that audiences cared about. Before long, we realized that if you were looking for a cooking recipe, you would probably search online, land on a website, read that recipe, or watch a video around the recipe, and then go on your merry way. But if you were a passionate fan of Star Wars or Star Trek or Batman, there was a very good chance that you would be spending far more time consuming that content. Now, we were pretty lucky because we ourselves were huge fans, like many of you are, of such programming. Now, some people would call me an OG of web video, and indeed, back when YouTube started is when WatchMojo launched as well. Now, I would email Steve Chen, co-founder at YouTube, to ask him for tips on how to better use the platform, and believe it or not, he himself would reply. And while YouTube came out of the gates as an aggregator of content and scaled rapidly and got acquired by Google for $1.65 billion, I was trying to make sense of how one could create a business around video storytelling. I started to write about the industry, published a lot of content on my own blog, and I would even write for industry publications like Media Post as well as TechCrunch. And we would refer to this magical pyramid time and time again to illustrate the opportunity that was made possible to entrepreneurs and disruptors like myself and WatchMojo. Now, as there was this disruption going on in terms of distribution, there was also this opportunity that was being created by this vacuum where DC, Marvel, Fox, or Disney simply had no economic incentive to embrace the web. 
So if you go back to the late 2000s and you were a fan of Batman, if you would search on YouTube, you would probably find somebody putting on makeup to look like Batman, or you'd find some fan of Batman sitting on his or her couch talking about the franchise. One day, after we had done all the biographies on famous real people, whether it was actors or musicians or athletes, it came to my attention that September 15 marked the anniversary of Batman's creation. So, had this created the idea to essentially do a biography of Batman, which led to one of our first hits, which were the comic book origins features. After covering Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, and then even lesser known comic book heroes, including Ant-Man, we then started to move on from biographies and started doing more and more top tens. And as you can imagine, that was akin to capturing lightning in a bottle. We had found our second hit, the famous top tens, which no, we didn't create. Before us, you had Dave Letterman, Wayne's World, and of course, Moses, the OG of what video. But considering that there was nobody really doing that at scale on YouTube, we ended up carving a niche that ended up explaining our subsequent success. Now, while Watch Mojo has been at this web video game for 14 years, the reality is we were not in the first wave of content producers. The first wave of content producers came in the late 90s when people like Steven Spielberg launched websites like pop.com and others launched channels like sudo.com to try to create programming for the web. But the challenge was that consumers didn't really have broadband and they weren't really conditioned to watch videos on their internet connection. As a result, those companies didn't really experience much success. After the dot-com bubble burst, there was this second wave of web video producers, such as Heavy, Mania TV, that wanted to essentially replicate the television model online. This was before YouTube, so if you wanted to create video programming, you didn't only have to worry about the editorial, but you also had to find distribution. But if you wanted distribution on your own and operated website, you had to build a technical infrastructure that could sustain all these heavy video files and also deliver them. Finally, you had to build an economic model convincing advertisers to essentially spend their money that they were still spending on TV on a medium that was beyond embryonic. Watch Mojo, along with Revision 3 and Next New Networks, is in what I call the third wave of video producers. We were naive into thinking that we could launch our websites, put content on the site, and essentially drive search traffic to our websites, selling advertising that had started to be a bit priced premium relative to banner ads found next to articles. However, what was very different for us, proved to be a game changer and forced us to change our playbook, was the emergence on the distribution side of these platforms like YouTube, Rever, Gooba, Metacafe, and Dailymotion. Now this was before Netflix, but these video platforms had essentially rewritten the rules. At that time, Netflix was still very much a mail order DVD delivery business. So as we were pivoting our business away from an own and operated destination strategy to a distribution strategy, there was the emergence of these next wave video producers who figured out that they will just bypass building a destination altogether. An example of that is Awesomeness TV, whose website was essentially a simple corporate landing page. You then also had new brands like Vivo that emerged as a joint venture between all the labels and they would basically just build a business literally on top of existing distribution that they or users had created for them by uploading music. If you fast forward to the contemporary times, which I call the Empire Strikes Back time, that's when brands like Marvel, but also late night show hosts have realized that since audiences are online, that they're going to themselves want to become master of their own domain and build up their presence on platforms such as YouTube. On that note, it's worth noting that while Jimmy Fallon has a million more subscribers than Watch Mojo does, we still have more subscribers than Jimmy Kimmel, as well as James Corden and Stephen Colbert. So recognizing this opportunity in the disruption on the distribution side and the vacuum on the programming side, admittedly, Watch Mojo capitalized and today created this community serving the fandom of popular franchises ranging from Star Wars to Game of Thrones, Andy Grove, who helped build Intel into a powerhouse, used to say only the paranoid survive. Fittingly, all entrepreneurs are always paranoid about what may be lurking around the corner. I've always recognized that what got us here will not necessarily get us there. So it's important to recognize a new world order. And what is that new world order due to? 
Well, even as recently as 2010, Time Warner's then chairman and CEO was quoted as saying when discussing Netflix, quote, it's a little bit like, is the Albanian army going to take over the world, end quote. So as recent as 2010, the beginning of this decade that's about to sunset, the head honchos at traditional media companies were poking Netflix, using it as a punchline. What ended up happening throughout the decade is this shift in consumer behavior where audiences were embracing and watching and consuming more and more of their programming through the web. Now you've heard me mention that content on like technology is not a zero sum game. And indeed, as Netflix's fortunes were soaring, so was the coffers of traditional theaters and studios that were pumping out movie after movie, garnering success. Over the course of the past decade, Netflix was cornering the subscription video on demand or SVOD market, while YouTube was cornering the advertising video on demand or AVOD market. Indeed, with 140 million paying subscribers, Netflix would be the ninth largest country in the world. Meanwhile, YouTube, with over 2 billion users a month, would be the largest country in the world. But while traditional media companies have had overall a pretty successful decade, the reality is, is that this new world order has changed everything. Consumers are now not only cutting the cord of their cable access, but they're also expecting to get more and more of their programming online. As a result, traditional media is blowing up their businesses, which are highly profitable, to embrace the web and go DTC or direct to consumer. And even though they're not necessarily aware of the future holds for them, they look at Netflix's success and realize that if they were to put their content online and charge consumers, there's a very good chance that between the goodwill of their brands and the strength of their programming, they will be able to replicate the business that they will be foregoing through traditional means, because if they don't, then they may be disrupting themselves into oblivion. So while Netflix was building up its business and signing subscribers hand over fist, studios were also building up a lot of value by taking old IP and bringing them to life in new movies. Not to be outdone, YouTube adopted a very different strategy of coming up with a lot of programming that audiences could consume for free. And if you go back to that lack of economic incentive that prevented media companies from embracing the web and putting their content online, YouTube saw an opportunity to basically give the tools to creators and the ad revenue to let them earn a living by getting into the storytelling business online. So what's happened is for an entire generation, audiences have been conditioned to get their top 10 lists from WatchMojo and not VH1, and to get their drama from the makeup artists on YouTube and not soap operas on TV. So in this new world order, that content pyramid has essentially been flattened, where Netflix's dominance in the SVOD market is going up clashing against YouTube's dominance in the AVOD game, while the studios are coming and trying to step in the ring, in the arena, to fight for audiences directly. So instead of this pyramid, the new world order is represented by these two spheres. On one side, the companies with the content, Disney, Fox, HBO, as well as NBC Universal. While on the other hand, you have these companies that have the audiences, the platforms, such as YouTube, Twitch, and many others. And sure, there's this added caveat that some companies like HBO already have millions of paying consumers. Now granted, while WatchMojo is well positioned to capitalize in this new streaming wars of the 2020s, you should be watching this and thinking that there are probably countless of opportunities that this new arena presents to you.